Hey everyone, it's Dr. Tiffany from TMD Collective, and this is going to be another episode of Jaw Talk. This episode is going to be so great, you guys. I am so excited that I got to talk to my colleague and friend, Dr. Courtney Donko. This is such a great conversation and Dr. Donko is such an amazing dentist. So she completed her doctor of dental surgery degree at the University of Iowa. And after graduation, she gained experience working in both private practice and in a hospital-based dental clinic in the Chicago area. Outside of clinical practice, Dr. Donko has completed numerous hours of postgraduate continuing education in the concentration of orthodontics, TMJ, craniofacial growth and development, pediatric and adult frenioplasties, cosmetic dentistry, Botox, and, der and dermal fillers. Dr. Donko believes in providing comprehensive and holistic treatment, which addresses dental structures as well as the whole body. Treating her patients and improving their quality of life is more than just her job. It's her passion, and she's devoted to making sure her patients receive the best care possible. Dr. Donko has had many great mentors along her journey, including notably Drs. James and Lisa McKee. If you notice, Dr. Jim McKee was on our last episode of Jaw Talk. In November of 2020, Dr. Donko officially joined Drs. Jim and Lisa McKee in practice at AIR Dental Group. All three doctors are excited about learning and growing with each other and enhancing the practice with their collaboration for years to come. So please join me. Let's dive right in to this great episode of Jaw Talk with Dr. Courtney Donko. Quick legal disclaimer, all information in this podcast is the opinion of the speakers and not meant to be a substitute for a diagnosis and consultation of a qualified healthcare provider. Hey everyone, it's Dr. Tiffany Lamberton of TMG Collective. This is Jaw Talk and I am so excited for my guest this morning, Dr. Courtney Donko. She's a member of my Chicago Study Club and I've been asking and asking her to be on the show. And so thank you for being here with me today. Dr. Courtney, welcome to Jaw Talk. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. I don't think I've missed an episode that you've put oh. out. So <laughs> thank you. Well, I'd like to start off with just like, tell us kind of like who you are, what your are passionate about? How did you get to kind of where you are right here in dentistry? Okay. So Courtney Donko, I practice in the Chicago suburbs. I graduated dental school about a decade ago, and I became very interested in human craniofacial growth and development, I would say in dental school, maybe even before that. And I just didn't know it, but yeah, the interest really arose in, in dental school. And at that time I was kind of looking at what authors like Tom Southard and Nathan Holton were doing. So they are two University of Iowa orthodontic chair or former orthodontic chair and anatomy professor. And then I was also introduced to what Mariana Evans and Kevin Boyd were studying with the, you know, pre-industrialized skulls and kind of what was like the, the normative craniofacial form for that population. And then got introduced to this idea that the form of our facial, our, our jaws and our face influence the dimensions of the airway, influences breathing, influences sleep. And so I would say I got interested pretty early. I knew that I always wanted to focus on that, but you know, right out of school, I think I went through what almost every new dentist goes through is just like a string of associate positions. I know there are some lucky people that find an office and they only practice in one office for the next decade or three decades, but I wasn't one of those people. I had some great positions. I had some not so great positions, but I worked in several private practices as an associate and I spent several years between full-time and part-time at a hospital in the Chicago area that's in a very underserved neighborhood in Chicago and dealt with a primarily pediatric population and had access to the OR and anesthesia and, you know, kind of dealt with rampant decay, that kind of thing. So by the time I bought my practice three years ago, I felt that I had seen a lot and I knew what I really wanted to do and what I really wanted to focus on. And over the last three years, it's evolved to where 80% of my practice is between 
three years old and nine years old. And I'm doing a lot of inner early orthodontics, dentofacial orthopedics, and I absolutely love it. I love that. And how did you even find um, Dr. Jim McKee and his practice? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I was getting more and more involved with CE and there was a small group that was organized to go to Dr. McKee's practice and spend a day with him learning about TMJ diagnosis and management. And that was Courtney Levine, Brad Berryhill, Tracy Wen, Matt O'Shea, and Bridget up in Milwaukee. So anyway, our mutual friend, Maggie Graham, was supposed to be part of that group. And so it's a small group, you know, it was kind of capped at that number. And she had her baby, I think like four weeks early and couldn't be a part of it. And so they reached out to me knowing I was in the Chicago area and said, hey, you know, we had someone last minute can't make it. Would you like to join? At that point, I'd never heard of Jim McKee. I hadn't taken any CE from Spear, but I, I understood that TMJ was something I knew very little of at that time and that it, it plays such a role in all these things that we're talking about with facial growth and development and airway. And so I said, yeah, I, I'd love to join. Let's learn. And so that was February of 2019 that we went out there and spent a day with Jim McKee. And then you bought the practice and kind of rebranded it. And now it's Air Dentistry, yes. correct? Yes. Yes. Air Dental Group. I bought it in November of 2020. And I would say it was like a very slow and gradual rebrand. And, you know, I didn't want to, it was such a, a good practice as it was. I didn't want to shift anything suddenly. And so, you know, just very slowly, I kind of integrated myself into there. I would say the first, the first six to nine months of me owning the practice, on average, Jim would practice two days a week. He would see patients and I would do four. So, you know, on my two days, I just see patients and the two days he was in the office, I, I pretty much just followed him around the majority of the time, just shadowing him and observing. So that was, I think, really, it really unique. It was kind of like a mini residency in a way. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So when a family hears about you, let's say, and they, they are like, I want you to evaluate my child, take us through kind of like your workflow of like, what, what does that look like when you're seeing, like you said, like a two-year-old or some like really young kids? Yeah. So when a new patient comes to the practice, I will typically spend an hour with them at that first appointment. The first 40 minutes, 45 minutes, we are not in an exam room. We're sitting down in a consultation room with mom and sometimes mom and dad. And then the child will have coloring books. They'll have toys. I'm going to give a shout out to Margaret at my front desk who really hooks it up for these kids. She's like, amazing. They absolutely <laughs> love her. Yes. Yes. They'll have a play mat on the floor. So mom and dad and I are talking and first I'm interested in hearing about why they're here. What are their concerns? What is this child's history? And at the same time, I'm getting glances at this child kind of unaware that we're watching them, but getting to see kind of what they're doing as they're playing, you know, how they're breathing, how they're posturing. And that gives me a lot of information. And then that's a bit of an education session too. Now I will say the majority of the families that come to my practice have a really good background in being educated by someone because most of them don't just, you know, Google me and show up. Most of them are referred in. So, you know, shout out to the speech and language pathologists and myofunctional therapists in my area who are just excellent in kind of giving this background education. Some patients get referred in from pediatric sleep medicine. Some pe patients get referred by the pediatric ENT. So, you know, a lot of the parents have kind of a baseline foundation, but I do take the opportunity to, you know, educate them on the link between dentofacial growth and development, oral posture, oral function, breathing, sleeping, 
mood and behavior, all of these things. So kind of try to tie together, connect the dots, if you will. And then the, the latter part of the appointment, you know, the remaining 15 minutes or so, we'll go back to an exam room. We'll have the child sit in the chair. I'll do a full exam. My assistant will be recording, you know, all the conditions that I'm letting her know about. And then we'll sit the child up. And because I have a kind of a referral base, most patients are pretty much pre-screened. So once in a while, you know, the, the patient, for whatever reason, it's not an appropriate candidate to start treatment now, at least in terms of dentofacial orthopedics and orthodontics. But the majority are. So I'll sit the, the child up and, you know, talk to the parents, you know, here's what I found. You know, this is what I'm seeing. Do you want to come look at this with me? My recommendation is we look a little bit deeper, get some more information that I can't see on the surface. And we'll do that by taking a cone beam CT. We'll take photographs and we'll do an intraoral scan. And at that point, I will step out of the room and my wonderful assistants will take over. And they constantly amaze me at how they get these their tiny photo, little Their kids photography is amazing. <laughs> It's amazing, take such wonderful pictures, be completely still for a cone beam CT, get high quality diagnostic imaging. I, I mean, my assistants are amazing and they do, they do that much better than I do. <laughs> if I were left on my own, <laughs> it'd be a whole nother story. So we get a set of records. And then so long as the patients aren't traveling from like a, a significantly far distance, we will meet in person again with the parent or parents in the week or two that follows obtaining the records. And that'll be an hour appointment where I will sit down with the parents and we'll put up on our big screen the all the imaging, the photographs, and we'll talk through, you know, what we're seeing. We'll talk through what the proposed treatment is, if there's, you know, any referrals to be made at that time to other providers the length of treatment, the financial burden of treatment, and, you know, kind of what are our expected outcomes? What are our goals? And then from that point, the, you know, the parents are, are pretty well informed if, you know, to make a good decision for them, for their family. And so if they want to move forward with treatment, then what we'll do is we'll send those intraoral scans to the lab for fabrication of appliances and we'll see the child back usually a month a month after that for the insertion of the appliances the beginning of treatment and commonly are you using bioblock or like kind of what are some of the favorite tools that you have for both uh, maxillary yeah. and mandibular decompensation? So I would say in, in the primary dentition, my go-to appliance is the BioBlock, or in other words, a, a removable acrylic-based appliance with a screw that you activate. And then there will also be lingual wires, wires that are lingual to the incisors. For a while, I was using fixed like a Hyrax type of expander. And for the pediatric patients, I really got into the 3D printed laser sintered bands because it's so easy. You don't have to place separators between the teeth on these little kids who can be, you know, very touchy, very sensory. And the fit is always very good. We have a wonderful lab here in the US that does a great job with it. We have a few of them. So I was doing those for a while. And then probably the, the biggest reason I got away from those, I would say twofold, is one, when you have the laser centered bands rather than the bands that go interproximally, you were, you're getting intrusion or if you will, in, infra eruption of the posterior teeth that the bands are on. And so, you know, if you have an anterior deep bite, that deep bite is just exacerbated at the end of treatment. Sometimes you're left with posterior open bites. Yes, the teeth do re-erupt or come back into occlusion, but I didn't like finishing like that. I, and, you know, I think Tiffany, you would understand kind of with the, the background in like restorative dentistry and like, if you've ever been, just feel like you've been hit over the head with occlusion, it just feels so wrong to not finish with a great occlusion. So I'm like, oh, I don't like that. 
And then I would say, you know, the, the, the second complaint is just lack of control, the position of the incisors. And so remember, I'm talking about a primary dentition. I'm not typically bracketing pr the primary teeth. Once in a while, primary canines in a mixed dentition case, but in a primary dentition case, I'm not bracketing primary teeth. I, I don't know that many people who are. And so if you have real malposition of the primary incisors, it's hard to address that with a Hyrax, with a, with a cemented RPE. So, you know, if you have very, very vertical or retroclined incisors, if you have rotations in those incisors, et cetera, you know, if you have a exacerbated curve of speed, those types of things. So that was a real benefit to me when I switched to these removable bioblock, if you will, acrylic based expanders, because I take them out once a month when the patient comes to see me and I can do some wire bending and you can get really nice positioning of the incisors and a nice finish in terms of like overbite, overjet with one appliance. And the cleansability of it, I think is really nice too. You know, that if we're having a young child, you know, wear something for 10, 12 months, it's nice that they can still get their hygiene cleanings at their general dentist office. It's nice that, you know, parents can take these out once a day, take them out in the evening, brush and floss thoroughly and put them back. Certainly not all appliances are made the same though. And I think kind of, I think in a way, removable appliances have gotten a bad rap and they are very technique sensitive. I, I mean, it is, I have found one lab in the world that does a good enough job that I will use their appliances. I've tried to work with two separate labs in the US and they couldn't get it done. And so it's very technique sensitive from the technician's part. It's very technique sensitive from the dentist's part. and the parents because daily they are in charge of being able to remove that and to put it back in. So a lot of companies like, like Vivos, for example, um, and, and probably others, uh, have designed, you know, acrylic based removable screw turn appliances, and they've put other clasps on them like Adams clasps and like pet ball clasps. And it makes it easier, you know, less technique involved with getting a really good fit and a really good seat, but they're a lot less retentive. And when they're a lot less retentive, we don't have that intimate contact of the acrylic on the vertical part of the palatal shelves. And so we, we really get less anchorage. We get less anchorage. And then that's when we get into the greater tooth tipping and then hence, you know, what a lot of people's big complaints are with removable appliances is it's dental alveolar expansion rather than sutural expansion. So that was kind of my long winded answer to say what I have found works really well in my hands, achieves good results and what I prefer to use because it, it really gives me a big range in terms of what, th what I can do. Yeah. I love that. And now you mentioned also kind of that interdisciplinary team where you may also be referring out, let's say maybe to the pediatric ENT or the myofunctional therapist. Are they working with those practitioners kind of at the same time or what's the, the timing of, of those kind of interventions? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly a case by case basis. You know, we've had some patients that come in with grade three, four adenoids and tonsils, you know, at the diagnostic records appointment. And, you know, we point that out and the parents already know there's an issue, but they're like, oh, yeah, you're right. They go to the ENT, they get tonsils and adenoids removed before we even start. That's mm -hmm. been the case in some cases. In some cases, we are going through expansion treatment. We, we know, you know, let's say there's enlarged adenoid tissue for whatever reason, timing works out that the child ends up getting the adenoidectomy. Maybe when we're midway through treatment, well, we take the expanders out the morning of the anesthesiologist does not want anything in that child's mouth, nor does the ENT and the, the child has the procedure when they get back home, when they're released from the hospital, then the expanders go back in. 
So, you know, with the myofunctional therapy, kind of same thing where there's definitely different therapists have different preferences, different individuals have different needs. So I have some children who work really hard at myo and progress and kind of get to like a plateau point in their treatment for six months before they come and see me. We'll jump in, we'll maybe do some expansion. And once we end that phase of treatment, then oftentimes the patient is returning to that therapist for more therapy, which we expect to be different and to have new goals and to be able to progress further than they had previously, you know, given that structurally we've made really nice improvements to the denofacial structure. So we hope that the, the muscular functioning can also improve more readily. Some children actually will continue to see their therapists while they have appliances through the mouth. They may decrease. They might have been a patient going weekly to that therapist. They may drop down to once a month or twice a month. And, you know, while they can't necessarily perform, you know, a tongue to palate suction with this block of acrylic in their palate. So they can't, they cannot perform some of the, what you would consider the goals of myofunctional therapy. The therapist can help them in many other ways. And that can just be, you know, speech, speaking with the expanders and um, swallowing, chewing, things like that. So kind of acclimating to their oral appliance. And then, you know, sleep medicine comes in and I'm going to say we have in the Chicago area, we have a fantastic physician. Her name is Anessa Donskoy. She is so kind. Every family that's ever seen her just has wonderful things to say about her. She is so intelligent. She actually read my daughter's sleep study when my daughter at two had had her sleep study. But anyway, so when we work with sleep medicine, Usually when I'm referring to them in that and not ENT is when there seem to be symptoms that are related to sleep disturbances, but maybe it is not from an airway obstruction, you know, or, you know, let's say that they are extremely symptomatic, but from, you know, an ENT standpoint, tonsils and adenoids are, are grade one and, you know, the the denofacial growth and development looks to be on track. So some things like that when I'm like, okay, this child is very symptomatic, but I don't know why. And I'm not certain where I should start. That's probably the minority of kids that I see, but sometimes I am referring directly to sleep medicine for that. Or again, we've tried X, Y, Z and there's still issues. Okay. Let's have somebody who is a real expert in this field, look into it deeper. I love that. I remember you documenting on social media, your daughter's sleep study. And I was like, oh, as a mom, I remember going through that with my kiddo. And I mean, he was a little bit older, but just like, you don't sleep well, you, you know, the, there's all of these things, but it's just, it's so eye opening to see the data that comes out of that study. Even if it's just a point in time for me, you know, I almost burst into tears because it was just like, I can't believe how many events that he was having in an hour. Yeah. You know, and to speak a little bit more on that. So from my, my personal experience with taking my daughter in is the sleep study for me because I don't have great insurance, was an expensive way to confirm kind of what I already knew to be true, that she, she did have obstructive sleep apnea. And, and you know, she was, she was symptomatic and I picked up on all those symptoms. But if you look at the raw data of her sleep study, her AHI was 3.1. So, you know, that's kind of right in the middle range for a child to have mild OSA. The events were categorized as central sleep apneas. And I've seen another child in my office come in with kind of similar data of these, you know, central sleep apneas. And that child had their study interpreted by a sleep medicine physician who treats adults primarily. And they're like, oh, that's fine. No obstructive events, central sleep apnea. It's normal. You don't need to do anything. It's fine. So what I so much appreciated about Anessa Donskoy is, you know, she is just so well-versed and so intelligent. And she, you know, was able to make the diagnosis of 
no, this is, there is obstruction. There is obstructive sleep apnea, even though our data says it as central. And because there can be many reasons why, and I'm not going to explain this that well, so get a sleep medicine physician on here, but there's, you know, certain reflexes that following like an airway disturbance, following like an RDI, that the child may have this reflex to breath hold, to kind of build up the CO2 back in their system. And then things with just like the, the nasal cannula falling out and not being able to, you know, record that end tidal CO2. So the technician is commenting on that, you know, when it happens during the study. So those types of things, you know, a great pediatric sleep medicine physician is clued into and is going to say, no, you know, the, I am di making the diagnosis of OSA. I think my whole point there was if it's a child, not just any sleep medicine, pediatric sleep medicine mm. needs to really look at that data. Yeah. Yeah. And then as far as like bringing in a provider, let's say you're evaluating whether a tongue re release needs to happen, whether there's like a functional impairment as well as that, where does that fit into your, your continuum? So when the kids are in my office, it's, there usually is some suboptimal growth and development of the denofacial structures. So it's usually address the structure first try to more idealize that, address the function with the therapist and as have with a team, with the therapist assess, you know, is this patient able to, you know, make their, their goals? And if not, why? And I think that's really where assessing the tongue tie should, should really, you should make a kind of final diagnosis at that point is, is the lingual frenum or the labial frenums or the buccal frenums, are they impeding function? And is the child having to compensate for that? And at that point, then in our area, usually most of the kids are seeing Dr. Milton Gavilis and he, I know requires every child to have pre and post-op therapy before he will do any phrenectomies. And so you, that's, a pretty typical sequence is sometimes there's therapy, then there's orthodontic intervention, then there's therapy, then there's the phrenectomies if appropriate, and then there's the post-operative therapy, wound care, etc. And are you seeing any adverse effects like in terms of like your older older patients are like are there sometimes like subpar outcomes for those kiddos either like not achieving kind of like the growth that that you were hoping for or, or looking for, or maybe having some type of a relapse? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, so when I see those children, you know, maybe seven, eight years old, um, early mixed dentition, and they, you know, there's, there's a real severe skeletal disharmony, you know, extreme vertical growth, high, you know, high angle class two, things like that. While I talk to parents about, you know, things that can affect growth, which in my opinion, there's genetics and there's the environment and in the environment, it is how we respond to our environment. So I think it has a lot, I think oral posture and oral function, you know, have a big input, but, you know, I'll talk to the parents on, you know, these are the goals of our phase, you know, maybe this won't be completely corrected. This is what we're going to try to achieve. We hope that achieving this will allow the child to function more healthily, more normally and breathe through their nose and create a tongue to palate suction at rest and rest with the lips closed. We hope those things will guide what growth is remaining on a better trajectory because at seven and eight, there's not a ton of growth that is remaining. We hope that that will guide the growth on a better trajectory, but depending on you know, your ultimate goals in terms of, you know, facial aesthetics, depending on symptoms, things like that, you may consider consulting with an orthognathic surgeon when this child is closer to skeletally mature. So that may sound extreme to some people that I would bring up orthognathic surgery to a family of a seven or eight year old. But when, again, when you have a 
very severe end of the case and you're getting you know, they're a little bit later in their growth. I think that complete transparency is, and that kind of goes along with the syndromic patients as well. So I have a child who presented at five years old, who was diagnosed at birth with Pierre Robin sequence. And so because at birth, th that child is starting out with such a mandibular deficit. Okay. Yes, we can all do our very, very best, but you know, the, the ideal treatment, again, depending on your goals and objectives you want to, you want to obtain, it may be, like I said, orthognathic surgery at skeletal maturity, but you know, we do the very best we can in the window that we have. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then can you talk a little bit too, because, uh, you know, you and I have chatted a little bit about the upper cervical component, you know, looking at like NBC3 and looking at some of the angles, some of the, you know, orientation of like C1, C2 that you can see in your cone beam CT. Again, you know, with kiddos, they don't tend to have any type of neck pain necessarily, but you can see postural changes and you can see muscular changes. H how do you integrate that as part of your practice? So, you know, there are some of my patients that they already have kind of established care with like an osteopath or a chiropractor, or I don't have a lot of kids that have established care with physical therapy, but certainly a lot with occupational therapists. Mm. Honestly, I feel that me making very specific recommendations for like the, the neck or the chiropractor or the body work is a little bit outside of my comfort level. So, you know, when there are, when there is, you know, body postural issues, I certainly point it out and say, you know, you may, you may benefit from having your child have an assessment by, you know, a chiropractor, an osteopath, et cetera. I don't know that I can necessarily make treatment recommendations, but I do teach the children exercises that not only focus on oral posture, but good body posture too, because there are a lot of young kids that are already forward head, oh, right. shoulders rolled in, you know, or kind of hyperextended like this. And so we, we have little tiny chairs in my office. I'll make, I'll have them sit in a little tiny chair and I'll just teach them a very simple like counting or speaking exercise with the emphasis on the resting posture. So straight spine, sitting upright, hands resting quietly in your lap, no forward head posture, head is carried over the shoulders. Okay, now that you're sitting up straight, you know, feet flat on the floor. And now I want you to count for me. By the way, I did not make this up. I'm gonna give Dr. Simon Wong and Sandra Khan the credit. This is their GOPEX. I'm gonna have them count for me. But after each number, I want them to rest quietly, briefly, but just rest quietly with a closed mouth. And it's, it is amazing when you tell this to the, you, so you explain this to the family, you demonstrate it, and then you tell the child, okay, now do it. Let's just do it to 10. The, it's the first time they do that. I mean, their postures all over their place. They're doing this. They're, some kids will count to 10 so fast, their lips <laughs> never even touch. <laughs> like they don't close their mouths during it at all. So, you know, I hope that I'm doing a little bit to at least bring awareness to spinal posture, head posture, jaw posture, tongue posture. But yeah, I would say, Tiffany, you can talk way more on this than I am qualified to do. I think that from the PT perspective, you know, it's not just about the osteopathic manipulation or mobilization, because that can be for sure beneficial. But unless you're teaching that, you know, postural retraining or that neuromuscular re-education, you're not going to you're not going to be able to maintain those benefits over time. You know, I think that that's where the PT piece of it that or the OT sense. piece of it is, you know, pulling that in. And it's not just, you know, okay, we see this on the CBCT. It's a moment in time. We see some misalignment. To me, it's also a yeah. movement assessment as well. And, yeah. you know, I think with chiropractors, 
there can be such a range. I mean, it's just like with dentistry, right? There can be such a range of practitioners and no you know, who did they train with? Where are they at in their kind of journey of, you know, postgraduate CE. And what I find is that especially our young females, they may already have a lot of hypermobility and a lot of joint laxity no and doubt. ligament laxity. And so if you're manipulating the, the upper spine, is there a chance that there could be ligament instability along with that? And are we being, you know, mindful of both, you know, hypomobility, but also hypermobility, you know, because typically what, what we'll see is, you know, if there's a dysfunctional segment in the cervical spine, and your husband probably sees this all the time too, is that you have compensations above and below to, you know, where you're watching someone move and they're shearing at like one level because that, you know, that level is so hypermobile because above and below is not moving sequentially. So, I mean, you and I have talked about, I'm such an advocate for Pilates because you're, you know, you're incorporating some of the breathing exercises and the spinal articulation and the spinal mobility. So I think maybe pulling in that, that person that is also doing the body work, but also pulling in that person that's doing that postural education and, and neuromuscular retraining to reinforce what the gains that you've gotten. Yeah, no, I, I agree with everything that you said that how we sit, how we stand, how we walk, how we move, it's also important. And, you know, it kind of makes you wonder more with like our modern environment, like I think many kids, you know, at the dinner table have chairs that, that don't fit them that aren't ergonomic mm. for them. You know, our babies are kind of being like C-shaped in these car seats and those rocking swings and things like that. And it makes me wonder, you know, like if it wouldn't be beneficial if there is a way to incorporate early, early on, like more primal movement, you know, mm. if you will, in you know, try to take our modern environment and maybe, you know, make it more postural movement friendly. Yeah. I think everything you said there was so important. Well, and you know, you get started on our soft diet and you know, how, you know, babies yeah. now are like, they're eating out of pouches or, you know, I mean, it's just like all of this, like melt in your mouth foods. I know that you're a big proponent of, you know, with your daughters bringing in a diet that, uh, you know, allows them to chew tougher foods. Uh, talk a little bit about how you've changed, you know, as a mom, what you've brought in for the diet piece of it? So I would say with my first, I was kind of like integrated into this world already. So, you know, from the time she was able to sit upright on her own, which I think for her was about six or seven months, and she didn't have, you know, eruption of incisors yet, just gum pads, I would give her like a quarter of a pear. So a pear that's very juicy and I'd quarter it and she was super clumsy and fumbly with it, but she'd take it up to her mouth and just gnaw with her little pat gum pads and, and chew and, and suck on it and drop it and pick it up again and all of that. And then, you know, from the time she got incisors, say like nine and 10 months, when we would go on walks in the stroller, I would give her beef jerky. It was hard, tough beef jerky sticks. And again, she would just gnaw, she would suck and gnaw and lick and she you know, hardly got any off, but it was a good chewing exercise. What I did do with her that I do question myself now is we did spoon feed early on before she had molars. And so before that infant suckle reflex would have converted to the mature physiologic swallow, we, we would use cutlery, we'd spoon feed her. And so, you know, I can't help but wondering the more, the more you learn, you know, if that use of cutlery in some way interferes with the, you know, the development of the mature swallow. So I would say, you know, if I were to do it again, I probably wouldn't introduce cutlery that little, that young, I would still do more of the, like the hand to mouth type of feeding. But, you know, I, I'd like to think that I did most things correct to the, the best that I knew how to do. Absolutely. Well, and we can't beat ourselves up about what we didn't know at that, you know, 
moment in time. So I wanted to kind of switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about dental education. So I know that you just recently went to Santa Barbara and heard uh, Dr. Gunson. I'd love to hear kind of some some feedback about that course and, and where you think, you know, dental education is going. Sure. Yeah. So I was in Santa Barbara and we had a five day course. So I can't remember the last time I did a five day course actually. So, intense. you know, it was very, very involved. Yeah. By Friday after lunch, I was like, I can't, I can't fit anything more. I can't, I can't listen anymore. So the, the lectures were Mike Gunson, who I've seen a few times, Bill Arnett. This was my first time hearing him speak. And then Jeff McClendon, who is from New York, he's a restorative dentist. Then the attendees, there were 50 seats. All 50 seats were filled. People came from all over the world. Switzerland, Costa Rica, Canada, UK, US. So it was really, it was really, very cool. And the, the whole week it was on orthodontics and orthognathic surgery. You know, Bill Arnett, just made some really good points that, you know, makes it that even I took away, by the way, I don't do that many orthodontics for like orthognathic surgery type of cases. So I'm not real experienced in that area, but, you know, I took away how I analyze though, you know, records on growing patients a lot. Historically, orthodontics has used cephalometric assessments, which many, use as your reference plane, the anterior cranial base or Frankfurt horizontal. And Bill Arnett is like, we're not treating the cranial base. This tells me nothing. I don't care. And, you know, same with our bite classifications, angle class one, angle class two, class three. And he's like, I don't care that they're in angle class one. Like this means nothing. Their upper incisor is not in the right place. Their maxilla is not in the right place. And so Bill Arnett has his own whole analysis that he does, you know, and part of that was on, you know, just natural head orientation. How, what's this patient's natural head posture? How do we determine that? You know, and he was talking about how with virtual surgical planning, sometimes the, the technician who is helping the, the surgeon do that planning will, you know, orient the head using landmarks such as the foramen magnum. And again, Dr. Arnett's like, when you look at this patient postoperatively after surgery, does that patient care that they're oriented on like foramen magnum? No, they care what their face looks like in the mirror. (laughs) And so, you know, it was, it was just fantastic. It was something like I could definitely take the course a second time and learn even more just because there was so much information there. I would recommend it to anyone. I, of the 50 people in the room, a third were surgeons, two thirds were orthodontists, and then I was one of two general dentists. But I think, I, honestly, I think it's valuable for, for anyone. So definitely a plug there. If I could you know, put a shout out to two more meetings coming up, if you are interested in, like I said, dentofacial growth and development, craniofacial topics. In April in Colorado, the American Cleft Palate Craniofacial Association is having their annual meeting. I'm going to try to make it to that one. I think that'll be great. And then Seoul, South Korea is putting on a meeting for the International Association of Facial Growth Guidance. And it seems as though Korea is, is really kind of leading in some aspects, you know, talking more and more about this. There was a a text that we were texting earlier on where I shared with you, I have this paper right here, published in the Korean Journal of Orthodontics. This is one of my favorites, but it talks about very early intervention on a Robin sequence infant and how they are securing the airway and, you know, kind of helping to encourage mandibular growth. So the lead author on that paper, she's actually at Stanford, but this got published in the Korean Journal of Orthodontics. So they're into the facial growth. And this is the one that you were telling me I should have on the po- the podcast from Stanford. That would be a cool show. interview. Yeah. 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 I think that there's, there's a lot of 
professionals in these academic positions that they contribute to research and they publish, but they don't have as much experience exposure in terms of, you know, like our typical like CE circuit. I love that. Well, and as you know, the face of dentistry is changing. We were talking about this, you know, basically, I think to like 2021, 55% of dental school classes are now female and there's more I women in dentistry. I did not know that. Is that, for the, <laughs> is that nationally? Like in the U.S., yeah. 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 We finally hit 55%. Wow. So wow. Yeah. I, I did know. not know that. Yeah. So what do you think the face of dental education, like where, where should it go? How, how should we guide this, this discovery? Because I, I think we have to be discovery integrating of all of these different concepts. Yeah. Gosh, I don't know that I'm a good authority on dental education and curriculum. That, I mean, it's a good, it's a good question. Certainly I have my, my own biases that I think we didn't get enough background on you know, growth and development, you know, of course you kind of got the, oh, what do you call it? Like all the neuroanatomy and neurodevelopmental sequences. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 In utero development and whatnot. But I don't know. I think that having more of that would be fantastic. Yeah. This is something you should ask someone in academics. No, I, I think that, you know, what I want to create is more like a female led education program where we're bringing in a lot of these topics, airway, sleep, myo, which could also be, you know, not just, you know, tongue tie, but also just the musculoskeletal system. How is that influencing growth and development? And also the TM joints, you know, I think that there's a role in what we've learned, you know, from Jim, Dr. Jim McKee, I think there's, you know, a role in, you know, assessment of trauma and early trauma. You know, there's, a, there's definitely a genetic component. You see these little babies that have, you know, like you said, Treacher Collins or Pierre Robin syndrome, you know, how recessed or class two mandible really compresses that oral pharyngeal airway space. So I, I think that that early intervention, I mean, I am just, I'm hungry for more, more education and more experience of like, how, how do you design a practice like that? And then also, how do we prevent temporal mandibular joint dysfunction and pain? Because a lot of my practice is that 37 year old female that had all of the, you know, kind of that whole cascade of effects, who's now, you know, kind of crying in my chair, like, why didn't anyone tell me that? So kind of like also turning back the clock on our young, you know, children and, and the next generation, how can we guide growth so that we don't have, you know, I mean, I was just at Dr. Drangschultz lecture, he's University of Washington oral medicine. And so he takes a very like a epidemiological approach to, you know, TMD and that perspective. And he was like, Tiffany, in your area, Seattle, Everett, Tacoma, there's 600,000 people that have oral facial pain. And whether it's adonogenic, you know, that's number one, but number two is TMD, you know? So how can we help, help you know, kind of guide and, and, you know, keep people from experiencing these types of conditions? Uh, I think there's a real, real need for, for better education in, in that perspective, so. I think you're you're part of this discussion, <laughs> and you're such a, a pioneer so. in what you've what you've developed, and that's why I just wanted to hear so much about you know what you you know your journey and what you've developed in your own practice and and what the workflow looks like because I think it's so valuable, and I think people are I, I talk to other female dentists and they want to hear this information. I think all the questions that you posed are are really something that we ought to be as a community exploring because there's so much that is unanswered, you know, as in terms of like the syndromes that you mentioned, we don't know for sure how those arise. You know, we don't know that if it's developmental, you know, if it's, if it is a genetic component, we know that it happens pretty early on in utero development. I think with both Robin sequence and Treacher Collins, what I, I think I'm hearing from the research is that between four to eight weeks gestation is kind of when these anomalies are occurring, but I don't think that we necessarily know exactly why, but 
you know, to some patients who are non-syndromic though, are certainly born with deficits in terms of their dentofacial development, you know, at, at birth, even at a full-term birth. And so that's what's so fascinating, I think, about studying growth is like, you know, there's such a spectrum and why, you know, why does it happen the way it does? And is there things that the healthcare community can do that are within our power to modify that growth and allow patients to live, you know, with better quality of life, I think ultimately is, is, you know, those are, is something I am insatiably curious about every day. So yeah, if we could get more people curious and asking questions and, you know, looking at research, I think, I think that'd be a great direction for like postgraduate dental education to go. I love it. I love it. Well, Dr. Courtney, I just feel like I could talk to you for like another hour, but I, it's like 54 minutes. So I just want to say as we're approaching, you know, this season of gratitude, I'm just, I'm so grateful for your expertise and for your time and your willingness to come on the show. I love being able to talk to you. I love being able to interact through the study club and keep keep doing what you're doing because there's such a need for it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. There you have it. Another fabulous episode of Jaw Talk with Dr. Tiffany. I just want to thank my beautiful and brilliant colleague, Dr. Courtney Donko, for being on Jaw Talk. I really enjoyed our conversation. And if you'd like to know more about Dr. Donko or be part of her practice, please visit our show notes for more information about her. And in this season of giving, would you consider a paid subscription to Jaw Talk? We have a Patreon account for where you can either do a one-time donation or you can do a small listener-supported for as little as $5.40 a month, you can support the show. Did you know that we're entirely listener supported? So if you'd like to see us continue to bring fantastic content, please consider a donation. I hope you have a great Thanksgiving and enjoy the show and we'll see you next time.